All the cool people. Nice. Good. <laughs> Tomislav, Jay, Isaac, Jeremy. What's up, Jim? All right. What's Good. Up? Uh, I mean, I so I didn't have anything specific in mind in, except uh, the link to, or uh, Kvan posted. You guys want to start with that? Oh yeah, did you look into that? Oh, a, a little bit. That's I. I actually was hoping I would be like all prepared, and I wanted to figure out some answers to some of my questions. Uh, but I did figure out one of them. But that's about it. Oh, okay. I, I was gonna say I, I fully intended to look at that stuff, and I was like coding K framework stuff right up until ten oh one. So you know, I bet we can. I bet we can uh, make it happen. Let's yeah. see. I uh, I can share my screen, I guess, and. Uh, Boom. How's that look? Yeah, great. Cool. So this is actually not, the doc on my screen right now is not the one that Kvan sent. Uh, this is the one that Kvan sent. So this is posted by Vitalik. It's called Bitwise LMD Ghost. And the very first thing is prerequisite, a different article also, or not also, but from Vitalik's blog. Mm -hmm. um, so the different one is a CBC Casper tutorial. This is basically Vitalik saying, Look, Vlad says a lot of cool stuff about CBC Casper, but he says it at a mathematician's level, and a lot of you people are blockchain people, so let's take a look at it at that level. And so he basically does the same things we've done, although he has something about rounds that I didn't fully understand, but maybe we can, we can get back to that. But basically he says, like, imagine if there's a certain number of validators. He says, so imagine there's N validators, then like, let's just say for the heck of it, let's say like Isaac makes the first block. So he's, this is Isaac's block here. Um, then, so there's five validators. Isaac will be like one, six, 11, 16. So like all of the multiples of five plus one. And then like, for example, J would be seven, 12. So I don't really know what's up with that or what it gets us, but that's at least how Vitalik described it. Interesting. Um, Wait, so, so you're saying you can only pr uh, propose blocks at like your designated position? Yeah, and he called them, I think he called them rounds, but I'm not 100% sure about that. And he, okay. he said in here somewhere, I've not read all of this, but I read at least half of it. Um, mm -hmm. He said, he talked about liveness in here somewhere, and he said, I think it's next section. Maybe it's the next one. I don't know. But he said something about the liveness depends sort of like on the underlying data structure. Um, I think there's going to, this is what I was looking for. Wait, what underlying data structure? Uh, okay, the underlying chain algorithm. Underlying so, he said, chain. so he said at the beginning, CBC Casper is cool because it's super general and you can come to consensus o over almost any d uh, data structure, which I think we've talked about with like numbers and lists and chains and trees. And, and then he says like, for the purposes of this tutorial, let's talk about a blockchain. Mm -hmm. Um, so then he says like the liveness piggybacks off the liveness of whatever the underlying chain algorithm is. For example, if it's one block per slot, which is what he described here, then it depends on synchrony assumption that all nodes will see everything produced in slot N before the start of N plus one. So I guess I was thinking maybe like, maybe he's not claiming this one block per slot is the only way to do it, but it's like, it's one that adds a really clear assumption that everyone can understand and gives us liveness. Oh, interesting. But he's saying in that, in that particular one block per slot case, or, uh, well, he's just saying you, you have like full synchronization, right? Like everybody has seen every message before the next, right. the next block is proposed. Right, exactly. Interesting. Okay. I think in reality, the only way to guarantee that would be like, everybody sends an acknowledgement, right? Like if I send in slot two, then I need to hear from all of my peers like, yep, got that one before we go on to. That's interesting, though. But like, isn't that trivially not live, though? Because like, what if I'm malicious, and I just don't send back, well, yeah. you know? That's a great point. So yeah. he's okay. So he says it's not possible to get stuck in such a way that one cannot make progress. Although it sure seemed like what you described was that. Yeah. He says and like, possible. yeah. And even, even not malicious, right? Like I just legitimately did not receive that particular yeah. message. Yeah. Network flaked for a second and you missed yeah, it. Right. Right. Okay. Either way though. Yeah. So that, okay. That's something interesting to keep in mind. Um, 
So, okay, so I don't care if we dig in more here or the, the more recent one with, uh, that Caveman posted, but I want to share my one tidbit of knowledge that I'm so happy that I discovered. My question oh. was, what the hell is LMD ghost? Yeah. And LMD stands for latest message driven ghost. Latest message driven. Which the good news is that's the ghost we've talked about all along where <laughs> we, take, we take a look at the latest thing we've seen from every validator and their weight is voting on that block and all of its ancestors. Oh, interesting. So are there, are there different like uh, ghost protocols that don't only depend on that latest message? Yeah, the proof of work ones are the obvious ones. Oh, yeah, okay. They, because there you're taking whatever the proof of work was for each individual yeah. block as as you go. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. Yeah. So, that was my that was my contribution. I, I provided oh, yeah. LMD's definition. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um So, I don't know, maybe should we just start here and go through this as we go? Sounds good to me. Uh, I have a question about the latest message. Uh, wh what does it mean? Uh, uh, in your justification, you have like a power set of, of messages, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have are, a uh, set, definitely. Yes, set of set, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what does it mean to have latest? Uh, are, are you looking in, in, in this all, all of this uh, uh, tree of justification, latest or yeah, so Vitalik had good diagrams for that. So in this in this one, it's um, there are actually no. Oh, that doesn't make sense. I, I almost said there are no justifications, but that's definitely wrong because Casper always has justifications, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so he drew. He started by drawing. Uh, oh wait, this is higher. Here we go. So here's some here's some blockchain that we might be considering, and his notation's a little bit weird. The block is labeled with the the sender. So like Alice sent this block, Bob sent this one, Charlie sent this one. And then the he's trying to illustrate a situation where four validators are playing by the rules and cooperating and B is attacking and trying to make a separate chain over here. And then he, he talked about um, everybody's individual view. So, well, except Bob's, but like, so here's the four honest validators individual view. Um, I wonder if I can make that bigger. So according to, well, let's do a more interesting one. According to D, he's seen, you know, definitely he's seen this message from A. It's one of, you know, it, his block D over here depends on it. And he's definitely seen the Genesis block. And we don't know it for sure, but he might have seen both of these blocks from B and this one from C too. And, and so Vitalik colored these ones blue and blue represents um, what we know is in the worst case, the latest messages that D has seen from, from the other validators. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so like C, it could turn out that D has seen this one and then D would say like, this is C's latest message, but definitely at least D has seen all of these. And so we know that D will use that information in calculating his fork choice. Right. Yeah, and we're only using those estimates proposed in the in the latest messages, right? Bingo. So yeah, so like since D has seen this block from A right here, D is not going to consider this block as a as a vote anymore. Now it turns out this float block is also supported by this block because they're in the same chain, but yeah. that doesn't have to be the case. Yeah, but like you know, alternatively, you know, Alice could have said like it could be binary consensus or whatever. And you know, at first it was like, oh, I don't know, I guess zero. And then after a bunch of network activity, it's like, well, it looks like one. And you know, this is my new estimate, and really only want to use that one that's based off of more information, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So. So can someone describe to me like five minutes, like what these blocks contain and how voting in Casper works? Yeah, that's a great question. Do you want to go for that, Isaac? Uh, so um, what the blocks contain uh, is going to depend on, well, a lot of things really. So like most of the time we talk about a really simplified uh, case where we're coming to consensus on like a bit or maybe like an integer or something like that. 
Um, mm -hmm. we, we've discussed the, the blockchain and block DAG consensus a little bit, uh, and, and the message structure is a little more complicated uh, in those cases. But like, for example, in, the, in binary consensus, we, we have a bunch of people we want to come to consensus on a bit, either zero or one. And uh, so each one of these blocks is going to have basically our guess as to, so our estimate as to which one it should be. Do you think it's zero or one currently? Uh, and then why do you think it's zero or one? Basically like all of the messages that you've seen that lead to you concluding that it's, that it's either zero or one. Um, so yeah. like in, mm -hmm. these, in these view, like you see C, D, E, A, and it's not uh, communicating. Okay, so these are just blocks in a blockchain, and this is kind of uh, people reaching consensus based on some like proof of something. Yeah, and and uh, specifically these these uh, letters that are labeling each of these blocks. Joshua was saying that these are <coughs> only the validators, uh, specifically in these pictures. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so the the. Um, CBC Casper messages or, you know, blocks always have uh, three elements. It's always, you know, the estimate, uh, the sender, and then the justification for why you're estimating the way you are. So like to take one as an example, yeah. if, we, if we take this one that C has here that diverges from the, what's probably going to be the main chain a little bit, mm -hmm. when, when C sent this block, it would, it would have three things. It would have an estimate, which in, in the blockchain case, the estimate basically is like, I think that such and such a block is the correct parent to build off of. Yeah. So in, in the case of this block C down here, its estimate is A's block. It's saying, I think this is the, you know, as far as I know, the most recent heaviest place on the blockchain to build. Mm -hmm. um, it has a sender, which is just C and, you know, a cryptographic signature from C. And then it has a justification, which isn't, I don't think is pictured at all in this diagram which is a list of other messages that C has seen uh, that may or may not be in its blockchain. So like, for example, C could acknowledge that he had seen one or both of these blocks from B without having to build on them by just including them in the justification. Okay. Yeah, so when, when he's saying A's view, uh, C's view, D's view, E's view, uh, this is really like what the blockchain actually looks like, right? So usually we're, we're kind of thinking in two different views. We have like the Casper view, with it, which includes the justifications and, uh, and then the blockchain or, you know, whatever other view we have, depending on uh, what kind of consensus we're doing. Uh, but this is strictly just that second view, right? Just the, just the blockchain view. I think this mm -hmm. is just the blockchain. And, and I think by showing these highlighted blocks, he's kind of showing some of the info that we usually show on that other Casper view. Okay, right, right. Yeah. Because in, in when we show the Casper view, what he's colored here, we would have shown those by just being like the bottom of the column for that particular validator. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, one thing that's not clear in a diagram like this is whether or not A, C, D, or E has seen anything from from validator B, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. yeah, and likewise, whether D or E have seen this one from C or... Right, or, right, right, yeah. Yeah, I guess the point in this case is that it doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, he like hasn't given weights. Maybe he's assumed they're all equal weight validators here. I was gonna say he hasn't given weights to anybody either. But yeah, I mean, I haven't read the article, but I'm, I'm assuming he's trying to do like, you know, really simple case, like, let's not focus on all of these terrible details and like, let's yeah. try to communicate something okay. regardless. All right. So I think well, let's, let's see what we can get out of this bitwise part and see if we can figure out what Vitalik's talking about here. I, I skimmed about half of this last night, but I, it started to get fuzzy and I went to sleep. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll take the first paragraph. Uh, I propose a version of the LMD ghost fork choice rule and an algorithm that makes it easy to tell whether or not a given block is valid under CBC validity condition of a block B with a parent P uh, is valid if all the evidence included in the state of B points to P being the correct result of the LMD ghost fork choice rule. This is a step toward making CBC practically implementable. So you want to take the second paragraph? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to reflect on this uh, rule for a second. 
Oh, gotcha. Not what we've always talked about the validity being. A block B with a parent P is valid if all evidence included in the state of B, so I guess that means B's estimate sender and justifications, points to P being the correct result of LMD ghost for choice rule. I think this is exactly what, what you were said uh, uh, earlier. Okay. Right. I, th I think this is it just like the right end. Yeah, yeah, sorry, you can, you, you can keep going. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I think this is just a way of saying in like uh, in English sentence uh, that the estimator of the justification is equal to the estimate. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Because the estimate would be P, right? The parent that we built on. Mm, yeah, yeah, mm. right. Yeah, all so to say that all evidence um, yeah. is like the justification is actually, well, the, whatever estimator you're using, right, the justification uh, is suggesting that that should be the, the estimate. And yeah, that, that makes total sense. And, and the estimator is uh, LMD ghost for just rule, right? Yeah. This is the estimator. This is the... Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay, that makes, that makes sense. Cool. So, so far, this is the Casper we all know and love. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Jeremy, you want to go? Sure. In general, ghost style for choice rule follow the same pattern. Start with the so, uh, start with some block H, then let C1 and C in. Is that the correct wording for that? Yeah, C1 and C in. Be the children of H. If the list of the children is empty, just return H. If there's one child, then set H to that child and repeat. If there's more than one child, choose a child that has the strongest support. This could be the latest block count, proof of work, or one of many other metrics. All right. So start with some block. Look at all of its children, zero or more children. So I just took that as if we can't figure something out, just go back to the, obviously the parent and just start all over again. That's pretty much just how I took it. Yeah. So, yeah. So if we're at some parent age and we want to figure out like which of these children is the right one to build off of. Well, if it's empty, then H is already, the, like if it doesn't have any children, you're already at a tip, return H, you made it. Mm. If, there, if there's only one child, easy, just go to that only child. Uh, but if there's more than one, now we've actually got a decision to make. So we choose the one that has like the most, the highest score, I think is how we always said it, or like the most validators acknowledging it or building off of it. Yeah, the heaviest observed subtree, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Yeah, cool. And if you have two childs that are have the same score, you can choose either one. That's a good question. We talked about a couple of different tiebreakers for that, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, one was so sort them by hash or something. One was choose arbitrarily. Yeah. Yeah, they, and they don't have any uh, one way to resolve those kinds of ties, do they? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't really seen like one official one that everybody seems to agree on. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Okay. Oh, you know, I never thought of this before, but like the the old school Bitcoin rule is, you know, they're using the longest chain rule over there. But like when there's two chains of the same length, go with whichever one you saw first. That mm -hmm. could be another. I mean, that's not a verifiable one that anyone could check, but it's at least something people could do. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's really just until one chain does eventually become longer than the other one. Yeah, exactly. Or in this case, its subtree becomes heavier. Yeah, mm -hmm. like until one breaks the tie, whatever the, the primary way to break ties was. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, okay, who wants to take that next one? I can read the next one. Uh, I propose a modification that makes forks always binary. That is, any H has at most two children. If a given block H has multiple children, then arrange the children into a virtual tree where we are deciding bit by bit on the hash of the child. Okay. Uh, for example, if H has three children, C1, C2, C3 with hashes, whatever, uh, then the tree looks as follows. Okay. So it looks like uh, C1 has the smallest hash. Yeah. It's like a tree spelled T-R-I-E. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, can you give us the, the 
two or three minute rundown on the important parts of those kind of trees, Jay? Yeah, it's uh, when you insert, say, like the first hash, um, you would check and see if there's a key, a child key of the parent with a zero because that's the first bit. And if there's not, you create it. And then you check for the one for that child's children. And so since there's none, you create the zero one. And it just goes on like that. That's what a tree is. Okay. Um, so like each, each level is like the next bit, basically. And you traverse it just by following the hash. Okay, that makes sense. So, so like uh, C1 and C2, both their hashes both started with zero. So that's why they both went left from H, you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Oh. And then it doesn't really show it in here, but at the bottom below. Hey, can you click that, the actual image, Joshi? Because it shows the whole thing. Yeah, it looks like it got. Oh, okay. wow. Much more sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Right. Because the first bit in the hash of C1 and C2 is zero. So they both end up in this left branch. Wherever, wherever it is they ultimately go, they're definitely located in this left branch. And then we just oh. traverse down depending on what the next bits are. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Just <clears throat> so this means that the, the hash will decide what is the order. Of the of child children. Yeah. And but I think he was saying his his purpose in doing this is to make it into a binary tree as opposed to this arbitrarily differently structured all over the place tree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean if your hash is just zeros and ones, then I guess it's gonna be binary. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's cool. We could do this in like trinary and make it a well, I guess a trinary tree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, Ethereum storage is, uh, you know, a hash with all the, you know, letters in the alphabet. And so mm -hmm. those trees have, like, I, I don't know exactly how many children, but 30-something. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, is that what they call fan out? I don't know. I don't know either. I, 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 my encounter with, with hearing about trees like that was in our chain context uh, with the name registry, because you can like insert all these different names into a registry to be looked up later. And I, apparently that's how it stores them too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like really efficient. I think like ultimately it becomes a B tree, but uh, okay. calls them Patricia trees. Oh, oh yeah. This, that, that makes sense. Uh, this is, this is the way how you store immutable structures. The, this is how they are represented in memory because you know you can easily add new elements and get to to any elements in the in the tree. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is interesting because it's like it's reminiscent of like a Merkle tree, but it's not a Merkle tree. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we've, we've achieved a way to take these weird trees that Vitalik and we have always, or not Vitalik, the Vlad and we have always talked about and turn them into binary trees now. Um, and so, and I think he said at some point his goal here is to like make this straightforward to implement. Okay. All right. So, okay, who wants uh, to go to? I can read the next time. Uh, <clears throat> uh, note that this means that if any of the three children has more support than other two combined, uh, for example, at least 51%, then it will win in the ghost for choice as before, but in none of the three is strongly determined uh, that the result could be different. For example, if C1 has scored 4, C2 has scored 3, and C3 has scored 5, then under simple uh, LDM ghost, C3 will win, but in modified ghost, C1 will win. Uh, okay, so... Let's see. So why does why does C one win there? Um, good I question. It, I don't think it shows in the data structure because it just says. So what did he say the weights were? I think it was four three five. Okay, four three five. So okay. I think he said under normal ghost, uh, under normal LMD ghost, C three would win. Yeah. That's definitely true because it's heaviest, right? Or it's, it has the highest score. That's easy. I agree. But then he, he was saying in this version, something else is going to win. Yeah, he said C1 should win in this case. 
Oh yeah. Oh, that makes, that makes sense. Because when you go from this very first block, we have to look at the whole subtree and the left subtree has a score of seven and the right one has a score of five. Oh, sure. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Ultimately we'll just end up at C1. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. When we get down here, then we fork again and we go over to C1. Yeah. Nice. Huh. Okay. Cool. I don't know why that's useful, but that's cool. Yeah, yeah, right. Something that we've observed. <laughs> that almost that almost seems like now staking isn't uh, doesn't have the same power it used to, but I, I, maybe that's a good thing. I, I have no idea. Well, he's about to conjecture about it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Oh, okay. Um, conjecture. This difference does not actually matter much in real life. It does not make any attacks easier. Because any attack that takes advantage of the new structure where C1 and C2 support each other could have also succeeded in a three-way fork where H had two regular children, D and C3, where C1 and C2 were children of D. Yeah. So let's see if we can sketch that up too. This is where it started to get foggy the other night. But so let's say if we have like H... And it has, and it goes to D, and then we have C1, C2, E3. So I think you were saying like this was possible all along, just in natural. Let's see here. A three-way fork, where H had two regular children, D and C3, where C1 and C2 were children of D. So okay. But that's, I mean, that's a different, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. What, what exactly is D here? Is it just a hash or is it actually a block? I was thinking of it as blocks in the chain, I, I guess. That's a good question. So. But I, I have a question. I mean, you, you're you producing uh, C, C1 and C2. And yeah. in this case, you know that you, you, you I mean, you know what, what, what will be the hash. So you can try different caches and say, okay, I'll, I will choose this one and because I know how, how to calculate it, you know? Um, I don't, we didn't use block hash on anything though, did we? So uh, in, in this case, you, you, you don't have a way to manipulate how this will be uh, calculated. But in, in case of hash that Vlad's suggesting, I mean, you, you know how this will be calculated. So you're saying like, uh, if there were a tie and we were breaking the tie by hash? No, I, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, in which branch uh, your, your block will be calculated. So mm -hmm. you, can, you, you can make a block with a hash that starts with zero one, right? Oh, I mean, you can you can try different hashes and, and say, okay, I will make it like this. And you say, I see what. Okay, so you're saying when we're following Vitalik's suggestion up here, if yeah. I'm making a block that was gonna go somewhere into this virtual tree that I didn't care for too much, I might just try again and get a better hash that puts it somewhere in the tree that I like more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you are just, you're, you're just comparing zero and ones and you know, uh, uh, you know what is the hash of other blocks? Yeah, right, that's right. I'm, I'm not sure if this makes sense or, or if this is possible. Um, I think it does. So like if we, if I was trying to create C2 here, and uh, C1 and C3 were already there. And so I go ahead and create C2 and it falls right here. Mm. And, uh, oh, or no, actually, let me, let me change the story a little bit. Let's say C1 and C2 are already there and I'm about to create C3. And I know that under regular old Vlad ghost, C3 is the heaviest and it should win. But because we're playing this new bitwise ghost, I see that my block C3 is going to go here and is not going to win because of this other weird thing. So I change some insignificant part of C3 and I get it so that the C3 builds off of like over here and now yeah. C3 can win again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty I'm not sure if this is possible. Yeah. Well, you know, if there's only three children, then you have, it's not, you try a couple times and you'll get what you want, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Changing from a one to a zero in the first place is like a 50% chance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Even if it built off of up here. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, what would what we really need, I guess, is maybe it's not that easy because we really need C3 to branch off somewhere one of these blocks because it has to happen there. after this break I, I think in general, you're doing like a pre-image attack on a hash function. So as long as it's cryptographically secure, I don't, I don't think that's possible. Like to yeah. do it all the way down, like you might be able to get it a couple levels down with a lot right. of work, but mm -hmm. in this case, we only have to, we only have to be three bits of the hash function, which right. we can do. Yeah, like, which, which is work. easy enough, but. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah it's like 12% yeah. chance. So you'd only have to try it a few times. Yeah, right. Well, that's, that's cool and interesting to think about. Yeah. Um, oh, and, and also, it, like, this is an idea that, that you had mentioned a little bit before, Isaac, but looking a little different, like, if you start spending time to, to do that, to, like, get your block into a favorable location in this virtual tree, it almost, like, overlays some actual proof of work onto the LMD ghost proof of stake protocol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you're a miner, you're not, a, like, a good validator. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. If, if we're using it, I can use my Bitcoin miner to really work fast at figuring out where to put that block in the virtual tree. <laughs> All right. Um, so he says, now let's see what this enables. We assume that the blockchain state keeps track of the following data structure. For each validator, what uh, for each validator, what is the height up to which the block that their latest attestation pointed? to agrees with the current chain. Okay, so this is a map from validators to heights. And the heights are um, the block that their latest attestation pointed to agree agrees with the current chain. All right, so let's maybe let's look at some of these again. So here's the big blockchain. So C's latest attestation is here. So the height at which C agreed with the current chain, in some sense, I think that's here, right? That's the last place C diverged. But then, like, whose view, who gets to decide what the current chain is? Yeah. You know, according to C, he never diverged. According to B, he diverged way back here. Yeah. Oh. What does it mean, latest attestation? I, I just interpreted that as latest block, but I don't really know. Maybe that's like latest block uh, from your, you know, your latest block in your view. Hmm. Oh, wait, okay, hold on a second. We assume that the blockchain state keeps track of the following data structure. So, oh, so this is not a validator. Yeah. It's, it's this, maybe this information goes in every block. Okay. I'm just guessing there. So every, every block has this map that tells us the height. Uh, Still a little confused as to what information it's keeping track of. Okay, I, I think I'm starting to get it. Hold on, though. This is just a guess. Tell me if this makes sense. Okay. So, so every so we're saying the blockchain state keeps track of blank, whatever blank is about to be. I think that means we update information about that blank in every single block in the chain. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if we look at a chain, every every single block in here has some version of this map, and they they all look different. And the, the map, so like, for example, let's just take E, this one that like, if we saw this whole thing, apparently E is the tip we'd build off of, right? Mm -hmm. So in E, there's a map that says for each, each validator, at what height did they most recently agree with, with me, you know, this block out here. Yeah. And so for validator D, that height is this height. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, for validator C, even though validator C also has a block at height six, they didn't agree with this E chain until back here at height five. And likewise for A, it was height five. And for B, uh, B didn't agree with this block until all the way back at zero. Yeah. So maybe that would be the map that was in E. Okay. Um, so this is uh, written in each block. 
That's my that's my guess right now. That's my working hypothesis. Okay. Yeah, I think that just, makes sense. Yeah, because he says the blockchain state keeps track. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes sense. I think that makes sense too. All right. So here we go. We store this as a number, two hundred and fifty six times the actual shared height. So I think actual shared height is what we were just calculating. Okay. Plus number of common bits, where number of common bits is the number of initial bits in common between the hash of the chain's actual next block and the hash of the ancestor of the message signed by the validator at the lowest height that's not shared with the chain. Mm. I lost exactly a little bit of what I was thinking. <laughs> exactly what I thought it had to be. All right, so, so this makes sense a little bit. 256 times the actual shared height. So like, mm -hmm. instead of thinking of when I said like this one's most common was at height five, right? We're actually gonna encode that as 256 times five. Yeah. And that makes sense because we're using a 256 bit hash function, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna take, you know, the, the course thing that we step up 256 bits at a time is like, how far into the blockchain did you most recently agree? And then after that, we've got this like more fine grained control that we're controlling based on uh, how, you know, this, this bit hash thing. What does it mean, uh, bits in common between the hash? Yeah, I think, I think that means like if we have two hashes, like one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, and then another one, 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 zero, one, zero, zero. So these ones have, we're not counting through the whole thing, but just leading bits. So they both start with one, one, zero, and this is kind of where they diverge. And so we would say like three bits in common. Uh, and, and, and when we look at this, uh, this uh, uh, tree from, from before, this binary tree, this means that we are searching for for a branch. Yeah. We're searching for a branch. Oh, interesting. Oh. Because this is exactly what, what you're written now, right? What What is in, in common and then... Oh, totally. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Yeah, so we're keeping track of where they diverged in this virtual chain. And we're doing that by seeing where they, first of all, where they diverged in the real chain, which is you know, every step in the real chain is counts as 256 bits because that's how deep this tree is going to be. And then once we get to the part in the real chain where they diverge, we want to see how many of the next 256 bits deep into this little virtual tree they went. Uh, Interesting. So, so can, we, can we think of this like uh, this hash tree thing that we're looking at right now as kind of like a layer on top of that blockchain view? Yeah, where, that's like, almost what I was thinking. Yeah, where like each, each block like has, you know, some amount of children and then each of those children is going to be like represented in that, in that hash tree the, the way yeah. that yeah exactly oh yeah yeah right so like this is this is our traditional blockchain right so let's look at this as the course view so every one of these blocks actually has a virtual tree which is a binary tree of depth 256 bits and then off of one of those leaves 256 bits later then the next block is built so like you could think about tracing some path of zeros and ones all the way through 256 bits worth of E, then finally we build this thing A. And so maybe Vitalik's optimization is like, we're gonna see exactly where in this huge, complicated and pretty sparse virtual tree, two blocks diverged by calculating it 256 bits at a time and only looking closely and that was last 256 bits. Uh -oh. And this is like, a similar to, to uh, hash graph, when, when we have a, a, a gossip about gossip, right? We, we also have this tree of uh, 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 ordering of messages. Oh. I mean, yeah. you, in, in hard graph, they, uh, he don't use uh, uh, this virtual tree uh, for, for, uh, like a get it from, from hashing, but in a sense, you, you have some kind of tree of uh, ordering of messages between validators. Yeah. 
Oh, so that actually does give us an ordering. Well, hold on though. Does that give us, what kind of ordering does that give us? Does that give us a total ordering over blocks? Uh, so he says that uh, uh, we will get total ordering when we, when we have gossip about us. Yeah, right. But he also mentioned some kind of hashing and, you know, just sending yeah. only, only bits of information, not the whole hash. And yeah, it makes sense in hash graphs, hash graph. But in this case, like, what ordering do we actually get that's relevant to, like, the order of the blocks in this virtual tree? Because it's really just about the hashes, which have no yeah. real relation to each other. Yeah, yeah. Here, here is not uh, related to, to uh, ordering of messages, but just or ordering by hash. Oh. Block. I see. Oh, so, Tomislav, you're saying maybe there's an ordering that might be interesting for various reasons, but it's not like time. It's not related to time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, like, a, like a, almost the same thing, but uh, like different way of doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So, okay. So we can now, I guess we now have a precise way to say like, where exactly did two blocks, like in our example, it was C and E diverge. And we can even say it more precisely than just like their common ancestor was A. We can say it was it was A and then 17 bits of their hashes in common or something like that. So okay. it, when it says that it's uh, doing this comparison between two different blocks, it says between the hash of the chain's actual next block. Yeah. Uh, so that's whatever block we're computing this from. It's the next block that it, I guess, has computed. And the hash of the ancestor of the message signed by the validator at the lowest height that is not shared with the chain. Which block is oh, that? The lowest height that's not shared with the chain. Okay, right. So, like, if we were trying to build on E, we have a validator D that branches off here, C that branches off here, A that branches off here, and B, and B, I guess, would be the lowest height, right? All the way back here. What was it again? Hash of the ancestor of the message signed by the validator, by, I guess, the current validator, at the lowest height that is not shared with the chain. Uh, not shared with the chain. I think the validator at the lowest height that's not shared with the chain, I take that to just mean like the validator whose latest message diverged furthest back into history. Like the, the validator who has least in common with me. I think you could use another picture at this point in the article. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Should we press on, you think? And Yeah. We're almost at the end, actually. Uh, okay. I guess I was maybe I was taking this paragraph. Uh, where were we? Right here. Okay. That is... Oh, here we go. <laughs> if the actual chain has head B1 and a validator's latest message is B2 and B1 and B2 have a common ancestor up to height N, and at height N plus one, the ancestors of B1 and B2 agree in their first K bytes, then the virtual ag agreement height is stored as N times 256 plus K. Okay, uh, yeah, that part I think we were good with. Uh, okay, cool, so that's one map that we added. So here's the next thing he's gonna add. Uh, I can continue. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we also maintain a, a mapping, a virtual height to how many validators whose latest message agrees about this virtual height. We store it in a subtree, uh, so we can now determine the all logger then time how many validators agree with the main block up to the la up to the least some given virtual height. We call this uh, agreeing on age. Okay, so wait, this is now a second mapping that we <coughs> are uh, keeping track of here? Yeah. Um, okay. Virtual height. This, this is the height in, in this virtual tree. Yeah. How many, how, many, uh, how many bits we have in common? Yeah. yeah. 
This is uh, some n times 256 plus k. So we those are the keys, and then the values are how many validators agree up to this point. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, oh, sum tree. Sum means store it in the sum tree. I don't know what a sum tree is. This is just a way of, uh, uh, to optimize it. You know what it is? Uh, no, 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 I'm just oh, guessing. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe some kind of way to, to like, an easier lookup. I don't know if this is the same thing. Oh, it's definitely some kind of tree. Maybe as we go down, we're just like adding stuff that's on the nodes. I mean, I'm totally guessing here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That seems like a decent guess. Maybe he's going to explain it here. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, okay. so to determine if a block is valid, we now need only verify one property that there is no virtual height H where agreeing uh, of H plus one is less than agreeing on H minus at H uh, times uh, one half, where uh, at H is the set of validators that agree uh, up to exactly H and where the latest sign message is of a block at exactly that height. Mm -hmm. okay. if, if it is the case that there is no such H, then the current block's parent actually is the LMD cross evaluation of the messages uh, the block knows about. All right, Jay, it sounded like you made some sense of that. Well, this just kind of takes us back to the beginning where it was the seven versus five. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so I mean like that formula right there at the times a half is the sum summation formula. Um, if you look it up for a series, uh, it's like the, the greatest minus um, I don't know. I'll have to look it up. Oh, oh! This is—is is this the the Gauss trick for si like summing consecutive things? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I remember that trick. Yeah. So you. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's kind of an optimization, like you were saying, and you're just comparing it to the height right above there, or or the opposite uh, height, h plus one. As long as h plus one is less than the sum of all the other subtrees, then you choose that one. So it's the same rule as we were talking about before, it's just formalized. Okay, so there's, okay, so we actually have to, it's saying we have to verify that there is no virtual height h where that thing is true, right? Oh, and that means the block is valid. Okay. So, all right. So, so we've got this map called agreeing. And uh, it's a map from virtual heights to how many validators agree up to that point. So, like, what are our height? What are the virtual heights that we care about here? Like, uh, so if we're talking about E and B, they, they diverge somewhere in the first 256 bits, right? Because the, they don't even make it one entire block into this virtual tree. So, so, so then they're, they're uh, virtual, wait, uh, how do you say it? I, so like they're agreeing up to a virtual height of less than 256, basically? That, yeah, I think, I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. So like, okay, yeah, so let's just say like, for example, let's say B and E diverge at, at bit number 100, hash wise. Mm -hmm. um, so then we would, we would be able to say that like, agreeing of 50 is five, because all five validators agree up to the first 50 bits in the virtual tree. But sense. then if we went to like, 101, like after where B and E diverge, then we would have to say like agreeing of 101, that's only four because it's only these four validators that are still on this chain. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so then let's see, like where's the next, the next interesting fork is here after A. So that's going to be 256, 512, 768, 1024, uh, some hard number. <laughs> 
twelve sixty maybe. <laughs> Sounds good. Twelve seventy, some number of bits like that, and it's going to be a few more because like some number of leading hashes, right? So it's fine that we're approximating. So like thirteen hundred bits in, yeah. C finally finally diverges. So we can say like agreeing up to twelve hundred is four, but agreeing up to fourteen hundred. Now we're down to. Oh well, that's interesting. Now we're down to only two because we lost we lost A and C because A and C aren't agreeing with either of these. Okay, so what was that doing though? We wanted to check whether a block is valid, right? So for example, let's check whether this C that goes over here is valid. And my like my instinct from what we know from Vlad's presentation is that C is perfectly valid because. C hasn't equivocated, C has probably not seen, or at least at the time of sending, not seen blocks D or E. So I think it should be valid, but let's, let's check that out in Vitalik's language now. Um, to determine if a block is valid, so we're gonna see whether C is valid, we now need only verify one thing. There's no virtual height H, where agreeing H plus one is less than this other thing. Uh, well, how, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite making it make sense, I guess. Yeah, the more I think about it, the less it makes sense. <laughs> so we have uh, agreeing uh, on H. Yeah. And what is the difference between agreeing on H and at on H? So agreeing, I, I think I understand clearly. Ag agreeing means like how many of these validators in our example, how many of the five validators are in agreement up to uh, H bits into the virtual tree. Into the virtual tree, right. Yeah, starting at Genesis. At, I'm not so clear on. So he says at is the set of validators that agree up to exactly H and whose latest signed message is of a block at that height. And what's so the definition of agreement? That was the definition of at. Or no, what you said for the definition of agreeing that it's all blocks that are, are in agreement at height H? All validators that are in agreement at height H, yeah. And a validator is in agreement if what? And a validator is in agreement if the latest message that they've sent has the first H bits in the virtual tree the same as, I don't know what. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a great question. So, like, if we wanted to say agreeing of, like, 512 bits, like, that, that means two blocks into the tree... Well, would we say it's four because there's four people agreeing down here, or would we say it's only one because only one person is agreeing up here? Wait, so if there are 512 bits into the tree, so, so two blocks into the tree? Yeah, right. Okay. So there's two blocks that meet that criteria, this C and the second B. So like when we're talking about agreeing of 512, do we just, do we say it's one or four or just like the higher of those? Oh yeah, wait, what was the definition of the agreeing thing again? Yeah. It's in this paragraph. Yeah, okay. How many validators who like this message agrees up to this virtual high? <laughs> What does this mean? What does main block mean? Main block in, in, in contrast to virtual tree. <laughs> no. 
Uh, my my assumption of main block is just like whatever block has the most support currently, but I don't know if that even makes sense. So I, I just thought of something else too. In the last map, we were talking about, we assume the blockchain state keeps track. And so we were talking about how like every block had this map. What was that map we were even talking about in the last paragraph? That, that was like how many bits were in common or something. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so maybe this map is the same way where it's stored on a per block basis, like a copy of it goes into every block. Maybe, maybe that's what he means by we also maintain a mapping. Like again, it's just like part of the blockchain state or something. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And so then that, in that case, main block might mean like, well, like whatever block it is, you're reading this map out of. Mm -hmm. So, oh, okay. Okay, I'm starting to get something. I, still not all of it though. So to tell if any, I, I was struggling with like, how is this formula that's supposed to tell me with whether like some block is valid? Like it doesn't even look like it's parametric in a block. Like I would just make this calculation once, mm -hmm. but we have to be reading this agreeing map from somewhere. So like, to tell if a block is valid, look at that block's own agreeing map. If this condition holds for that block's map, then that block is valid. Hmm. But I still don't quite get the condition, but that I think that's progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, what does it mean to H plus one, agreeing of H plus one? So you're always agreeing. Agreeing is a map that maps from some virtual height H to how many validators agree with the block that you're looking at up to that height. Yeah, so, you, so basically it's just like if you go one, one further uh, height, I'm not really sure how to say that, into the virtual tree, like one level down. One, right? one, you're comparing one bit, uh, one yeah. bit more. Right. One additional bit, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, and then you're saying like now given that the next bit is like zero, one, whatever, like how many validators now agree with this new thing? Okay, so we, so we, so okay, I, I, I think we can do an example now. We wanna see if block C is valid, right? Yeah. So we look at the mapping, the agreeing mapping that's in block C itself. Okay. So that agree mapping is gonna say, validator B agrees only to 100 bits, validator A agrees all the way up to here, mm -hmm. times 256, mm -hmm. uh, E agrees almost as far, D agrees you know, a little bit not as far, and that's everybody. Yeah. So now we need to check this condition. And the condition was, agreeing at H plus one, Uh, oh, we need to check this for every H and make sure that there are no such H's. Um, so we, wow, okay, so we just need to choose some H. So should we just choose an arbitrary one and see whether this condition is holds and maybe that'll give us intuition? So like, let's just choose uh, 256, 512. Let's just choose like 1100 bits. Um, so 1100 bits mark is going to be somewhere like in here. Oh, that's a terrible example. Cause it looks like it's a binary number. <laughs> 1102 bits. Okay. 1102 bits. So, so we need to now evaluate. So, so that's H. And that's about where it is. So, so then we need to evaluate how many validators are agreeing up to 1103, right? Um, so A is, mm -hmm. and C is, yep. and that's it. Yep. So um, I'll just write that down. Agreeing up to H plus one is uh, A and C. Okay, and then we also need to see how many are agreeing up to just H. So, how many is that? H 
That's the same, right? Just A and C. Looks like the same. Okay. So then what was this? Uh... So the left-hand side here is two people. Mm -hmm. The right-hand side is, oh, two minus however many are at H. H was just some random thing in the middle of the tree though, right? So like, Ooh. oh, you know what? Um, we don't know whether E is agreeing. E might be agreeing up to here actually, right? Because that's partway through the next block. So like if E and C hash uh, enough common first couple bits, then E might be past that threshold or it might not. Oh, in fact, that's what would make this an interesting case, right? If E is just up to that threshold. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's add E over here. So is in that... this case, though, E is to the right past A. So wouldn't that mean it agrees at least with A? E, well, we're reading the agreeing mapping out of this block C right here. So this oh, block okay, okay. doesn't know anything about these DREs over on the far right. Gotcha. So, okay. So, so we've, I think we've discovered why this might be an interesting case. So we've, we've chosen this point where E just is up to the threshold so that E doesn't count on agreeing H plus one and does count agreeing of H. Uh, so then we need to also calculate at H and I need to look back for that one. Uh, the set of validators that agree up to exactly H and whose latest signed message is of a block at exactly that height. So in our, in our picture over there, E agrees up to exactly H, right? That's why we chose H the way we did. And E's latest signed message, I'm not sure about that second part. Um, yeah. Then the current block's parent is the LMD goes to validation. Well, let's see. I'm starting to think maybe we should get through those last two paragraphs and then uh, reflect more next week. Yeah. Well, yeah, because latest signed message isn't ever going to be reflected in the diagram we're looking at either. That, well, yeah, that's what I, kind of what I was thinking, because like E definitely has a later signed message way over on the right, but are we supposed to use that information? Yeah, we definitely don't know that, or we don't know if we know that yet. Um, yeah, exactly. Validator C may or may not know about that, you, you know, yeah. and who are we in this? Maybe we're validator A or E or... Right, and, and even, even closer, like, does A contain any signed messages from E here? Mm, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Well, A, this A definitely at least contains this E, I guess, right? Because it built on top of it. Sorry, say that again? The, this block from A definitely at least contains, well, not the whole signed message, but like at least a pointer to this signed message from E. Saying yeah, this. yeah, but we don't necessarily know if E agrees with A, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, so in, in a sense, we are, we are going to, through this virtual tree, uh, and comparing, uh, uh, like a ancestor one by one to, to the root, right? Yeah. Like one bit at a time through the tree, right? Yeah. But I'm, I'm not completely sure why, what, what we are comparing. Yeah. Yeah. And still. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's see if this next paragraph helps. Because agreeing declines monotonically, as it represents how many validators agree up to at least that point. I mean, that makes sense, right? Agreeing is always gonna be fewer people up to. Okay, uh, we can do this in O of log squared of n time. Binary search the max height h, where at least half of all validators agree. Verify the same condition as before. Then binary search the max height H where at least a quarter of all the validators agree and so forth until you reach the end. All right. 
So it's big, big O of log squared because there's two binary searches. Uh, that makes sense. Okay. A binary search is log n, and we have to do two of them here. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That would be two times log n. Oh, yeah, you're right. Which is of log n. We must have to do a binary search for each max height h. Is that it? At, so you first binary search the max height h, where at least half of all the validators agree. And then binary search the max height h, where at least a quarter of all validators agree. Oh, oh the and so forth is what makes it log squared. Yeah. Because then we're going to do it until an eighth agree. Yeah, OK. OK, because you're doing log, big O log n uh, binary searches. What does, what does log squared look like? It still folds. It's still better than linear, right? Uh, oh yeah, definitely. So, uh, log to any power is less than linear, you know, oh, yeah, okay. asymptotically. Yeah, right, right. Okay, good. Um, final paragraph. Notice that the fact that each node in the virtual tree can only have at most two children is necessary for this technique to work, as it ensures that verifying that agreeing does not step down too quickly uh, is necessary and sufficient for verifying bitwise ghost compliance. Uh, does anybody see why the step down too quickly? I just want to do this. Is, yeah, why that's important? <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I definitely feel like I know what it means and why having a binary tree makes it not step down too quickly. I'm not clear why it's necessary and sufficient. Okay, so what, what are we even talking about here in step down too quickly? So we're, we're talking about how agreeing of H varies as H varies. And so we, we all said that like for small H's, that means you're close to the Genesis and everybody agrees. And as H gets bigger, you're closer to the tip and fewer people agree and it decreases monotonically. Yeah. Well, in Vlad's old school Casper, where we had these trees that, you know, everyone could have multiple children a lot. Um, yeah. you, you, you might go from like, uh, you know, from at height zero to height one, agreeing went from five to four, like it went down by 20%. And then uh, from A to D here, it went down from four to two, it went 50% in one little step. Mm -hmm. So by putting 256 bits in between each block, definitely, or, you know, with really, really high probability, we're never gonna lose more than a single validator in a single step. And further, there's going to be lots of steps in between where we don't lose anybody. Okay, that makes sense. I think that's what step down too quickly means, but I, I don't get why that's like a critical thing that we had to use here. But... Um, But I, I don't know. I mean, do you guys want to just call it a week on, on that? And then we can maybe next week we'll share other thoughts we had about this and hopefully get back to Hashgraph. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Isaac, I have one question for you. Sure. Uh, you mentioned uh, when we were talking, I think last time or, or, or before, uh, on, on a binary consensus, uh, 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 you said that uh, if if we don't have symmetry, then this is the problem. I don't remember exactly something, uh, but, but uh, in, 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 th in this case, we also have the similar situation, right? Um, so I think, uh, so the context that we were in before was uh, what trying to produce like binary consensus that never terminated almost, I think. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that how is, is this like a similar because in a sense we are, we are breaking the symmetry right to, with this binary tree. Yeah, that's what it seems like. It, it, yeah, um, I would have to think about it, you know, because uh, it seems like yeah. So uh, if I understand your question correctly, it seems like when we have uh, some kind of symmetric situation, whatever that means, like in terms of you know weights and number of validators or something like that. Uh, 
what I, I think what we can do is something like last time where there's just like constant uh like back and forth almost with like that diagram that that uh that Derek um you know gave and and um but if we don't have that symmetry then I think there's always like some sort of like tendency towards one one value over the other I, I would have to think about it though definitely cool yeah all right, guys. Um, I just saw that Kevin was in the in the chat. Kevin, I'm glad you made it today, man. Thank oh, you. For yeah. Doing sorry. That. Sorry. Oh, I, was, I, I had a status meeting that didn't end on time. Um, that that was a great little write up to go over, man. I'm really glad you shared that with us. So um, I have something else to share, and um, there is a Medium article that that has some nice graphs, and I went through that. I read. Uh, the original article as well, and I'm just having a hard time grabbing my mind around it. So yeah. thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. That, that yeah, really yeah, yeah, man. Thank you for sharing. Drop, drop that Medium article. Let's, let's see if it's something we want to talk about. Yeah, I just put it in the Discord. I put it here oh, too. Nice. So. Oh, yeah, cool. It's called, oh, it's more, it's about this similar thing. It's uh, yeah, yeah. LMP Ghost and Efficient CBC Casper Forward Choice Rule. Oh, nice. this might clear some stuff up. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so I went, like, like I said, I went through this a couple of times, but I'm just having a hard time following it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's that. I'm glad we talked about it. So it's already, almost, like, it's almost like there's not enough time to talk about all the cool consensus stuff, you know. <laughs> so are you? Did I hear it correctly? Next week you're gonna talk about this as well. Well, what what what, do, what does everybody want to do? You know, whatever anybody wants to do, I think we could clear up all of our uh, you know myths or lack of understandings about this article, and then go back to Hashgraph. Yeah. yeah. Great, great. Um, and you you meet Fridays at eight a.m. or seven a.m. Oh, I'm sorry. You you made at, it. We've been meeting at fifteen hundred, which is. 1, Okay. 10 o'clock here in Ohio, which is, I think, 7 for you out in California. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay. But this, in, in Google Calendar, yeah, I think it's uh, one hour earlier. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't change that. I know we, uh, we decided last week to start meeting a little bit later. I, I can change that in the Google Calendar as well. Yeah, I, I, forgot, I forgot for today, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. Oh, no problem. That's okay. So again, right. thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. I know it was a short notice. Um, I'm going to watch the, the video later to catch up with the first cool. 15 minutes that I missed. Nice. Great. Man. All right. Well, should we stop and restart recording and talk about some process calculus stuff? Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right.